All right, looks That's like we're live now. Um, so I uh, want to thank everyone for coming on. Um, this is a Knox Youth Athletics Olympian Q&A panel. Um, I really appreciate all y'all trying to reach out and, and join on. Um, you know, we wanted to talk to y'all, get some information about, you know, kind of your thoughts on what's going on, but also kind of rehash back to your Olympic experience and kind of some advice you may have for athletes, especially ones that are just coming up through our programs. Um, to give them advice on like how to get through some of these difficult times, as well as um, just how to set goals and, and develop as they move forward in their athletic career. Uh, so first I want to introduce everyone. Um, I'm Chris Kane, president of Knox Beef Athletics. In the bottom right is Brent Smith. He's the vice president of Knox Beef Athletics. Um, hey. Charlie, Charlie Simpkins, a 1988-1992 Olympian in the triple jump. Tony Perilla. 1992 and 96 Olympian in the 800 meter. Missy Kane, the 1984 Olympian in the 1500. Uh, Kelsey Abe, who is a pole vault Olympian. Eric Long, the decathlete in um, 1992. Uh, Tavis Bailey, 2016 discus Olympian. Tony Cozy, a 2300, 3000 meter steeplechase Olympian. And Jim may hop back in, uh, possibly, but he's preparing for, for a big Zoom uh, meeting with 300 other pole vaulters around the, the country. So I um, want to go through here. What basically, we'll ask you a, a series of questions, um, we'll jump to each person in kind of an order, and then um, Brent has some general questions that he'll ask throughout. So if people are watching, we've got about 15 so far on there. Um, if they have questions, they can go ahead and ask those questions. We'll try to feed those in as we can. Um, so the first question I have is for Missy. Talk okay. about walking on to UT and your development into an Olympian in a period when women's track was really transitioning from the IAAW uh, to an NCAA sport. Well, maybe it'll be encouraging to kids out there that it's never too late. I mean, track and field is one of those sports um, where it's really never too late. It was for me. I, I never ran track in high school because we didn't have a track team. And um, it was one of those God things that I think um, – I, I was kind of a wayward teenager. I needed to find something. And my parents said, you better get involved with something at UT besides partying because I came from Nashville. And really track and field kind of focused me. Um, I went by the track one day and a girl in my sorority said, hey, there's a sign about trying out for women's track. And I went, she went, will you go with me? And I said, well, sure, I guess. And we went down there and did some sprints for Terry Crawford and found out I made the team. And then the next day in the Daily Beacon, it said, first day women's track anyone could join. So that's literally how I made uh, the first UT track team. And it just gave me discipline. My grades got better. Uh, it, it changed my life, um, but it wasn't overnight. I was never, I didn't qualify for an individual event um, until my third year at UT and never made a final in the 1500 during college. Was on a couple of relays. Uh, Betty Sonnerfeld was on one of my relays for my 800. Um, but really it was when I was 27, 28, after I taught school and came back to UT to get my master's degree, I jumped in with the women's team then and realized that I was stronger, better because I'd been doing cross training, which I really am key on. Even more so nowadays, people talk about it, but I think that's what helped me get stronger in my later 20s. So don't feel like you're, um, a lot of the kids, like, I'm missing a year. What it, it's, it's terrible, but one, you can stay in good shape. And, and two, you know, for some people, for some people, it may be a blessing in disguise. You're muted, Chris. Still getting used to all this stuff. Uh, Tony Cozy, next. Um, I love this story. Talk about your Olympic experience and what it's like to become a first-time father when you're halfway around the world. Tony, you're muted. Yeah. The the. Not muted. Still there trying. You are. There you are. Can you hear me now? All right. Um, all right. So yeah, I had an interesting experience in my Olympic career. Um, uh, having my first child, Taylor, uh, being born while I was overseas, um, that was unique and and maybe brought some uh, some undue publicity, but publicity nonetheless. Uh, 
being that it was my first child, we, there was actually four Olympians. Alonzo Mourning was another one that had a child born at the Sydney Games and then a couple of baseball players. Um, mine and Alonzo, it was our, or Zoe as we call him, um, that, was, that was our first. Uh, Zoe took the Miami Heat plane back and had his, made his. And uh, for me, it was an NBC experience in that they were shooting satellite pictures and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, having Katie Couric and, and the, you know, having the Today Show involved with that situation was unique. Uh, but more than anything ever, it, it put perspective on um, sport for me and uh, perspective on life um, as we deal with postponing even these games. Um, you know, it's for us, and I, could, I don't want to speak for everyone, but you know, it is our life. It's a selfish sport. We train, we do everything we can. We literally uh, blood, sweat, and tears uh, to get uh, to the highest level in our sport. And to have something like that happen, um, it puts things in perspective and, you know, perspectives, everything in, you know, kind of with in this day and age for sure. And the postponement of the current games to next year. Uh, so it was, uh, it was bittersweet, but something I'll never forget. I told you before, it's one of my most vivid memories as a kid in track and field was watching that Olympic trials at midnight or whatever it was here um, when I was just uh, 12 or 13 years old, I think. Um, Tavis, moving on to you. Talk about what it's like to be a full-time Olympic caliber athlete while working a, a full-time job, and how did you balance those two in preparation for the Rio Games? Um, that was actually really, really difficult. Um, it was something I kind of just bit off. Um, it started, my work started as just an internship and then grew into a full-time position. Um, the discipline was probably the number one thing that helped me get started in it. Um, I'd wake up every morning, go to work, work a normal work shift, and then I'd get off every day at 5, 5.30, and then go to the track and train from 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock at night every day. Um, it kind of became a normal, and so to me it was just what I did every day. Um, I worked hard at it and it ended up paying off for me. So um, anyone that feels like their training conditions are subpar, it's, it's just another obstacle. Um, and it actually, I feel, makes me, made me a little tougher for the rest of my life and as an athlete. Um, being that I was training and maybe not the best time of the day and uh, had a lot more on my plate. So when it was time to kind of relax and focus on track, um, it kind of gave me a little bit of an edge. All right, and uh, moving on to Tony Frillo. Uh, talk about what the difference was between representing your country in a foreign land in Barcelona in 88 versus when you're four hours away when in the Atlanta games in 96 and kind of the differences between the two. Well, the, the Olympics is, is a really, really personal thing that, you know, you, you have the opportunity to, to represent your country. And, um, and for me, being originally from Puerto Rico, it was, uh, for me, it was more of a decision of, you know, if this is going to be my job, I'm really going to have to figure out what's going to be the best for me and my family. And there are very, very, very few lanes. And, um, you know, they would generally give one to, at the time, uh, to, to the uh, athlete from the USA. So if I was really going to do this and really put all my eggs in that basket, I had to do the best that I could and, you know, you know, take the hard route and represent the U S um, it, to me, it, it wasn't a step down. Uh, it, it, it was just, you know, I did, it, the, I did have everything in my heart to want to represent Puerto Rico, but at the same time, I live in the U.S., train in the U.S., go to school in the U.S., so I was actually blessed to be able to have an option, whereas some people don't. Um, I enjoy, you know, meeting a lot of the athletes from Puerto Rico and the coaches and still have a great relationship with some of them, and, you know, I have a great, you know, great relationship with a lot of the U.S. Olympians, so I was, so it was very fortunate to be able to have an option and then go ahead and uh, make the U.S. team, which was, uh, which was a huge blessing, and then, you know, being able to make it twice and the world championship teams, you know, it just really gives me a pride that, that that when I do, you know, I feel really, really proud to be able to represent the U.S. 
you know, and, you know, and in the beginning of uh, every single game, I put my hand over my chest and I really think about um, every time that I, you know, was able to wear the red, white, and blue. So it was a very tough decision, but at the same time, I absolutely, you know, have been blessed and honored to be able to represent the USA. I think that's a natural pivot to Kelsey from <laughs> next question. What went into your decision making and, and you can see the maple leaf behind you of representing Canada um, versus the U.S. where you're born? Yeah, so um, first of all, I am a dual citizen. So half of my family is Canadian and half of my family is American. Um, but similar to Tony, coming out of college, um, it was really a question of what's going to give me the best opportunity to be the best I can be and pursue the sport at the highest level. And for me, that was representing Team Canada. They've been amazing in giving me support coming up through the ranks all the way up to becoming an Olympian. And that was something that was really important, especially because when I moved to Knoxville, I was finishing grad school and I was moving to a new city. And I was really looking at, I was single. I was thinking like, how am I going to support myself and pursue this dream of going to the Olympics and ultimately jumping as high as I possibly can. And that was to represent Team Canada. Okay. Um, Charlie. Yes. Charlie Simpkins. Coming from uh, Baptist College, which I believe is now Charleston Southern University, um, not many knew who you were going in um, to your professional career. It seemed like you had to coach yourself going into 1988 when you finished fifth place in the, in the triple jump. What changed for you to take you to the next level um, so you were able to finish uh, silver in 92? Well, um, I realized training myself wasn't going to work. Um, I decided to move to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, to train with Dean Hayes, <clears throat> which is an Olympic jump coach. And then um, when I lived in Charleston, I had a lot of distractions, partying too much, having too much fun, wasn't focusing on training. So, and I felt like in order for me to change and get any better, I need to move away. I moved away, <clears throat> didn't know anyone but my coach, got a fresh start, got refocused. Um, but my coach was a um, really big influence on my life because um, if anybody knows Dean Hayes, he, he's something else. He had me do some stuff that I thought that a human being could not do. <clears throat> and um, being with him and him motivating me and getting me refocused, um, doing a lot of soul searching, doing a lot of praying, made me realize what I wanted to do, what I needed to do, <clears throat> and what hard work that I needed to put into it, and it paid off. Thank you. Um, Eric, Eric Long. Um, most of us were only like three or four in 92, but some people were old enough to remember. Um, you're part of a very memorable 92 Olympic trials decathlon that many still talk about even today. Talk about being part of such an iconic uh, competition with the whole Dan and Dave deal. Um, and was there additional pressure for you with all the press and eyeballs on just that one event? Um, I would really like to start back in 1990 when Visa picked this up as a corporate sponsor and really brought Decathlon back into the forefront uh, back before when Milt Campbell, Bob Mathias, Bill Toomey, Bruce Jenner, all those guys were dominating the world scene. Um, Visa came in, stepped in, and, and, and made us a team. Tony talked about, and I think Tony was, it's a selfish sport possibly. Um, Decathlon was a team sport, even though you're out there a lot of hours together, 10 days or, you know, 10 hours a day. Uh, we really helped each other walk through that. Dan and Dave were a blessing because they took all the pressure away from us. I was a junior in college, just winning 1991 NCAs in Eugene, Oregon. And nobody still really knew my name because that's the big push when Reebok came around. So my training partner, Brian Brophy and I both scored over 8,200 points. There were several other People that had that potential, Kip Jamberin and, 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 and those folks. So them taking the spotlight and Reebok doing what they did for them really uh, didn't make it easier. We still had to get out there and compete and, and perform our best uh, on that given day. But when the cameras were following them around, it gave you a, a little bit of peace of mind where you could go talk to your coach, uh, resettle. You know, there's good events, bad events. So. It was a blessing to have them and was a blessing for the sport of decathlon back in the United States, getting it back to where it needed to be with a, a great corporate sponsor. Guys, I got a general question here for the whole group. Um, thanks again for joining us and everybody here 
happens to live in the Knoxville area. So outside of the obvious, what makes track and field uh, special in this community? And the anyone history, who feels like it. Um, the history of track and field, I think, you know, um, I just saw Terry Crawford was my coach and she's moved back to Greenville um, part time now, but she was the first team in 81 to ever win a national title for women. And, and of course, Stan Huntsman and Chuck Rowe and the history of Tennessee track um, is so strong uh, going back to the 60s, 70s even. So I think that's, that's what's, I think, created what really KYA and youth has here now is because a lot of the f people that went way before them. Appreciate the shout out, Missy. Uh, Stephen, uh, with you, how did you turn your athletic career into a, now a TV career? And because uh, I feel like I've grown up, I've known you a long time because everyone <laughs> thinks we're related. I, even last week, I got that question. Um, oh, yeah, my son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you did adopt me, I think, at one point. Yeah. You said I could claim you. Yes. Um, <laughs> but most know you now more as Missy Kane, fit and fun, um, than know you as an Olympian because of all you've done for the community. Um, so how did you, how were you able to pivot from Olympic career and turn that into a, uh, a long time TV career? Uh, well, at the same time, when I, I, I'm maybe different from some people, but maybe this would help some kids is that I never had dreamed about being Olympian. I wanted to do well in my sport. But again, I, I taught school at Central after graduating at UT, taught for four years, went back to get my master's in exercise physiology to work with corporations and kind of what I'm doing now at Covenant Health. But um but I always want to do well. So when I ended up making the Olympic team, um, it was just so unexpected. I think for a lot of people, even myself, I was just so um, blessed to have that happen to me. Um, but at the same time, I always was working on other goals at the same time. Um, for me, I was working on my master's. I was teaching aerobics on the side. Um, and so when I think that year came, the Expo Road Race was, of course, a really big road race here in Knoxville, like one of the first big road races. And so Bob Kessling said, hey, Missy, you won it last year, but you're not going to run this year because of the Olympic trials. Do you want to commentate it? And I sat on the back of a truck and never had a microphone in my hand and went around, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, I forget who won that year, but anyway, I went around on a truck and Bob was really nice. And I said, this was a lot of fun. And um, I said, would you ever think about hiring me to do like some fitness tips, health tips? And he said, well, yeah, after the Olympic trials, uh, give me a call and we'll see what can happen. And so that really kind of launched me into that um, area. And so I just always tell people um, sports can open up a lot of doors, but you've got to make your niche too. You've got to create your own, uh, what you want to do out there besides just be an athlete. So for me, I was very blessed. And I think uh, not just athletes, but you look around our world, everybody needs fitness uh, on different levels. And even coaching the Covenant Health Not So Marathon team, people that might just want to lose weight or people that are overcoming cancer. I think what we learn in track and field can help so many other people with their own um, health struggles nowadays. So um, that's how it happened. I, I need to always thank Bob Kessling um, for kind of giving me that opportunity. I'm sure your viewership has gone up, up in the past couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> by the way, people that, people that are watching on the live stream, we got about 25 kind of, uh, right now, but if y'all have questions, feel free to ask and, and we'll pass them on. Um, Tony, uh, when I was a freshman in high school, okay, you had the 1600 meter record broken by Dusty Miller. It'd been a long time record. I don't know how many years exactly, but a few, um, and 411, that's such a big deal. Uh, but now about 24 athletes have run that or faster. I don't want to sound like a bash question but when I ask this, but growing up as a central high school athlete locally, um, how have you seen the sport change in Knoxville and in, in the state of Tennessee in your lifetime? Yeah, it, it's changed dramatically. And, and, you know, you, you know, Missy did, you know, you thanked her for the shout out with KOA earlier, but uh, truly what Marty, the foundation Marty had laid and, and with even Knoxville Track Club's uh, backing, you know, where Marty first associated, um, really that's the foundation that was laid that now we're seeing fruits from. And, and as a result, you know, the, the statistics you just, you just gave, one, that mile record actually was, it was what, uh, 21 years before somebody broke it. Just thought I'd just do the little shout out there. 
but uh, with that said, now I mean, when I when I I think um, when I ran cross country my junior year, um, you know, and there were different folks, and this is what it really is about. It's about giving back to the community and like Missy's done, like everybody, Eric, all, all the guys, different, Tavis, Perilla for sure. I mean, the, you know, you guys, I mean, all everyone on this call, I mean, as we try to give back to the youth in this community, and that's really what it started for me with Bobby Glenn giving back to me and just literally showing up Central High School. We'll shout out to Central High School too, being the three people here on this call, including Brent, you know, that's a little bobcat action. But seriously, um, you know, Bobby would show up after school and say, hey, you know what, you should do this. And that was when, you know, maybe there wasn't a KYA or it was just a thought um, or a dream. You know, he said, hey, let's go down to Foot Locker and try this other race. And that was the first time I'd ever been out of Tennessee. Um, the reality is um, there was a bigger stage. And um, at some point through KYA, Knoxville was ready. And as we prepared our youth for these bigger races and to travel and to do other things, um, you know, if you give folks the opportunity, they'll rise to the occasion. And our youth is an example of that. Um, you know, and from that standpoint, uh, you know, you give them the platform and you have folks just like the folks that are on this call that give back to this community. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, there's, a, there's a hunger for that. Um, people want to be better. And if you provide a way for them to do that, um, again, people will rise to the occasion. And you guys are, you know, doing a great job of that and carrying on that torch. And so I commend you for that. But, yeah, I'm excited about the prospects uh, moving forward. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm excited. I get excited when I hear folks breaking records and doing things that haven't been done. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it was, for me, that was, that's one of the reasons why I get back the way I do. I want to see that. I want to see, I want to see folks do things that haven't been done or, uh, have the opportunities maybe that I didn't have. And, uh, that's important. Um, now that record's, I think, four flat, uh, for the state of Tennessee, it's pretty, Pretty it crazy is. in that particular event. Uh, Tavis, uh, Rio was the first time the Olympic Games was in South America. Did you get to experience any of the culture and food? I had read a story about you. Um, how were you thinking you would just eat what the U.S. team provided for you and not try to get out into it? But were you, did you have that opportunity? Yeah, actually, it was actually something I was kind of worried about. Um, Kelsey would know kind of being down there. Um, you you the marketing and the hoorah of the Olympics makes you really think you're going to this grand event and you are going to this fantastic event, but like the reality of it sets in. Um, as soon as you land, you're on a bus and you're in third world country, you're driving past favelas and slums and thinking like, man, just kind of going out and eating is not necessarily something that I really want to partake in. Um, but the cool thing about Rio was that there was a little bit of sightseeing and there was some tourism things to do and a group of us did get out um, to kind of experience the town, kind of go to some of the nicer areas of Rio um, and kind of enjoy some of the culture. And the Brazilian culture does have some, some interesting food. Uh, it's centered around a lot of beef um, and meats. And the cool thing about it was that you didn't have to necessarily venture into, um, you know, the back roads to, to get that experience. Um, being on Good Morning America, they had uh, Brazilian chefs serving um, Brazilian culture food, going to some of the sponsors' houses. Um, they'd be serving cultural food. So um, the, I guess the, the organizations that were involved in the Olympics did a really good job to kind of bring that culture to the experience so that you didn't have to venture out to, uh, to, to experience those things. Yeah, it's important for people to know that like sport like this can can take them all over the country or the world. Um, everyone, Todd Williams is watching, so if you want to say hello, um, <laughs> Kelsey, um, I'm sorry, hey, Tony, well. <laughs> uh, Tony Perilla. It's uh, into. <laughs> he's just watching. He can't talk. Uh, <laughs> did growing up in a military family make the Olymp Olympics mean something different for you than maybe some of your teammates you were with? Um, I think growing up in a military family, what we do is, I mean, I, I think we have just a different outlook. I mean, it's not that we're better. It's just, we just have a different outlook. I mean, we're being raised overseas. Um, 
you know, at six o'clock every day, they would have, you know, the rivalry. So we would stop no matter what we're doing, no matter where we are, we would pull the car over and we would, you know, just go ahead and, you know, just put our hat, our, uh, our hands over our hearts every single day at six o'clock, you know, the rivalry is going. So, I mean, so we grew up in a little bit of a, of a, a different, very, um, you know, hyper, uh, you know, a hyper patriotic thing. So when I was able to make the team, it just, um, it just kind of added a little bit of closure to all that because I was probably the first, me and my cousin Alexis, we're the, we're the only two males in all of our family that never went into the military. So I was kind of, you know, kind of had a little bit of a hole, you know, in me somewhere that I was just, that I just didn't get to serve like all of my other cousins and my uncles and my father and, and, you know, my aunt and, you know, some other people, my sisters. So it just, uh, it just really, you know, gave me an opportunity to give back to, to the country that was, that, that we were in that has given us chances. All right. Um, I agree Kelsey, you. you're in the middle of a <clears throat> COVID-19 pandemic, unlike anyone else in here. Um, as an athlete. Well, everyone is. But. Well, I mean, but as an athlete <laughs> I know what you mean. training for um, the, the 2020 games, uh, first of all, what went through your mind when they decided, uh, what, what did went through your mind when they decided to delay the games to 21? Well, it was quite the whirlwind because I feel like everything happened so quickly and things were just changing like day by day and even hour by hour. Um, so honestly, once the NBA was canceled, I think people or postponed people started to to talk and there was some chatter about okay what is this going to mean for the olympic games and actually being a part of team canada we were the first country to announce that we weren't going to be sending athletes to the games whether they went forward or not so that was a little bit stressful just because it meant if the games were to still happen i wouldn't have the opportunity to compete um but i think our federation was pretty confident that if we took that strong stance that other countries would follow suit and put a little bit of pressure on the IOC because honestly it was a little bit stressful because you have all of these inputs coming at you that are saying stay at home this is serious be safe take care of yourself take care of your family do the right thing but then at the same time we're being told by the IOC that we need to keep training games are on business as usual um, so it was a hard place to be in as an athlete. So I think postponing was the right decision, obviously. And um, for me, it was met with a lot of different emotions, one of them being relief, one of them being confusion. Um, part of me is excited because it gives me more time to improve. So I think there's still a lot of questions going forward. Will we have a season this summer? Um, and what will next year look like leading into the Olympics? All right. Um, Charlie, yes. you talked about in uh, 1992, I did some research, I find these old, or old articles, um, <laughs> but in 92, you talked about on your final jump and you're sitting in fourth place, everything went in slow motion for you. What mental training did you practice a lot did you, did, to help you lock in in that ultimate game seven, you know, bottom of the night type of situation? Um, how, did you, how did you lock in and focus? Um, interesting. I got a friend used to tell me um, he knew when I was, was going to compete really well because you were able to look into my eyes and say you had that look. <clears throat> and I'm like, what look? But what probably was this is that track and field is a very individual sport. And when I used to train, I had to train by myself. And there was a lot of days I had to go out early to do some soul searching because I know practice was going to be so hard until I had to pray up and, 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 and sometimes cry because I felt like I wasn't, wasn't going to get through it. But that preparation of being out there by myself, training with my coach, him being on my back, staying mentally focused and able to visualize my jump. Um, visual, when I'm in practice, I used to visualize how to execute my jumps and my technique and stuff. And from doing that type of training, once I got there, it was more like second nature. It's probably like kids playing in the driveway and practicing the free throws and three, two, one, you know, and, and practicing. So uh, it's very helpful, Brent. 
I'm sorry, uh, Eric. Um, you were part of a legendary group of decathletes, which you kind of mentioned before. How did having so many talented guys um, training with you help propel you to an NCAA title in 91 and eventually the Olympic team in 92? Uh, the best thing uh, that happened to me was I got my butt kicked uh, my sophomore year. Uh, Doug Hedrick was leaving, which made me the number one decathlete. So, you know, big hooray to me. And they brought in Brian Brophy from, I think, George Mason and transferred in. And he was a much more accomplished, much more polished. Uh, he had been doing decathlon through high school. And I was, you know, it was my, really my second year ever balding or throwing the javelin or running the 1500 meters, those things. And he came in and put a butt whooping on me. And uh, there, he, he talked about soul search and I, that was a big soul searching moment. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not a loser. Uh, my wife told me when she married me, she didn't marry a loser. And <laughs> that's, that's why I kind of lived my life was uh, I had to figure out, I mean, I, I had to make some life, life adjustments. I, I was a partier, Missy Kane and I party. Now she's a lot older than me, but uh, <laughs> no, it was, is you know, how, how do you tone those things down? How do you remove obstacles from your life to get the result that you want? If I wanted to be an average uh, top five NCA person. I, I wouldn't have trained as hard. If I didn't want to make the Olympic teams, I wouldn't have trained it hard. Uh, having a great partnership with Brian and Bill Webb and Doug Brown, and then Visa incorporating some of the greatest minds in, in, in track and field. We had access to obviously the United States Olympic Committee, and that was in Colorado Springs then. And then throughout my career, went out to San Diego. But uh, when you have people Bruce Jenner and Milt Campbell, Bob Thies, Bill Toomey, Rayford Johnson, those guys mentoring you and talking, you have direct line of access. And that's what the great thing is about Knoxville. Uh, you, you probably know this, you're a statistician. In 1992, we had 18 people in the Olympic Games from the Knoxville University of Tennessee area. Yeah, I just looked that up today. I was texting Tony about it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's monster impressive. And you know, Tony's a lot more involved than I am uh, in the Knoxville youth sports, but whenever he asks, uh, I get out and volunteer and do whatever I can. So this forum right here is really good. Uh, the kids can really reach out. There's a ton of uh, information and knowledge. And fortunately, I think all of us had the opportunity to get that from someone, and it's our turn to give back. Uh, unfortunately, we're in a time... I was a coach when Eric was, I did not party with Eric. I was a good <laughs> friend of I, I used to kind of sneak and see, make sure you weren't partying with my girls. Is that? Oh, right? okay. 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 And Eric, you wound Missy up. Yeah, uh, oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> kind of toss up. <laughs> I'm done, Missy. Right on breath. Right on breath. All right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I got a toss up here, and anyone can answer this in more than one, but uh, this kind of goes along with today. Um, with everything we're facing, I'm a high school coach trying to work with kids who we're looking forward to the season, and, and you know, with everything that's happened, all that's changed. Um, the question is, was there ever a time when training was difficult to get in, and what did you do to get through it? And to add on to that, do you have any advice now for those who uh, haven't seen their best days yet? Maybe it's going to be a year where they just train through. Uh, what would you say to them as well in reflecting on your own difficult training times? Kelsey, you probably know that. Yeah, I mean, I'm in the middle of that because I'm adjusting my training um, because of the circumstances. But honestly, I'm having a lot of fun trying to be creative with what I can do at home and what I can do outside. And I think it's really an opportunity to just explore, you know, what other types of training modalities are out there? How can I just use my body to get in shape? How can I use the hill outside of my house to get faster? Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity with that. And I think adversity is always an opportunity to get better. I've seen that before in my own career with injury. I've had to be creative working around injury and it always makes me better. So I'm honestly excited about it. I think it's a fun challenge. Um, and I hope that high school athletes can see it that way too. Um, and I'm sure you can pass along my information. I'm happy to like help any high school athletes who feel like they just have no idea what they should be doing right now. Cause I'm in the same boat. Yeah. yeah um, Kelsey there, that was a big deal for me, uh, working full time and then trying to train full time. Um, you're, you you do not always have the best conditions available to you. You don't always have the best facilities available to you. Um, I remember being on the road when I was, 
traveling for sales and uh, kind of trying to find a track on Google Maps. Um, but for all the high schoolers out there, this is a perfect time to try other things like trail running. This is a perfect time to try, you know, pick up basketball with your older siblings. Um, this is a perfect time to just try all the other sports and cool things and um, out there in the world. And I personally taught myself how to throw um, wearing socks on a wood floor and YouTube videos. So social isolation is a great time to learn how to throw discus. <laughs> Well, I, uh, and, you know, you've kind of gotten into mountain biking for exercise. I saw that picture and I thought, well, I hope he drove right behind where he took the picture because I, I don't <laughs> think I could bike all the way up. That was pretty high. Yeah, uh, that, uh, mountain biking is a great way to kind of change your engine. It's done a lot for me. Um, so I would recommend it for anyone looking to get some high intensity training or some additional cross training in. Yeah. And I hope you, you look like you're practicing safe social distancing. <laughs> also, um, just one more. One more thing I just want to add. I think athletes today, we've been like taught to think that the only way to get better is to like be lifting weights and doing all of these crazy types of workouts. But I'm sure some of you could speak to like how training used to be a little bit more simple. And I think this is an opportunity to get back to that. And I know that's something that Missy's husband, B. Miller, really encouraged me to do last year. And I saw a great benefit from just like keeping things a little bit more simple and not trying to overdo things in the weight room or in gymnastics or whatever. You want to want any of the older people, the more established people want to comment on that? Yeah. And um, I thought I'd get B Miller to come in, but I, you know, like just your regular planks and core, I, even Terry Crawford, I was talking to her and she said, boy, I wish I'd done more with you all, but just the basic push-ups and planks and things for your core are so important and you don't have, like Kelsey said, you don't have to have heavy weights to do that, um, to get strong. They're asking about core fitness and things that you've told Kelsey to do. That, here's Coach V. Miller that, that coached Kelsey last year a little bit. Uh, anything, any tips about core fitness that you don't have to do? It really doesn't fit? have to be crazy, right? Like you can get a lot done with your own body. You don't have to go in the weight room and like kill yourself. Yeah, I think a lot of times, especially in the vault, we have there's so many variables and you guys have so much technique that you have to learn that it's really important to just have good good general fitness and this idea of, of a really, really strong body weight exercises really go a long way. I think so. So kids, if there are kids out there now that where I can't go to the club or I can't go to the gym, there there are so many things you can do. Uh, pull-ups, push-ups, sit-ups, core exercises. That stuff is amazing, and that made a huge difference in Missy's career. Nice. Uh, appreciate the Jim B. Miller popping in here. Uh, we'd hope to have you on there, but good luck tonight. Uh, hey, yeah, it, hey, I just want to say that I, what's amazing is that all these different stories, these, you, wherever you start, these, these guys, are, this is an elite group of athletes, and it's amazing to um, – we, we can say all we want about this idea of, of – making the Olympic team, people don't understand how elite that is and that that really the coaches are there just to make sure we don't do anything too crazy because they're the ones that are motivated and, and we're there just to teach fundamentals. It's really that athletes make good coaches. And to keep Eric Long out of trouble. Now yeah, we, <laughs> we kept each other out of trouble. Good yeah. job, I like you. you. Know, if you don't mind, Jim, I did have one question for you that because um, we got some coaches watching right now as well. Um, what do you say that, uh, what would you, what would your advice be to them getting through this, um, situation? Yeah. How I, would you advise athletes? Well, I think it's really fun what you guys are doing here. I think just stay engaged. It's stick together and stay engaged. That's why we're doing these online clinics. And that's why this is, this round table is such a great thing. It's, we got to stay connected in a little different way, but if we can keep kids engaged in what they're doing, we can be creative, like Kelsey said, and, and get a lot done. But I think that's the important part is we gotta we gotta stick we gotta stick together. Yeah, that's very good advice. Um, Missy, um, well, maybe both of y'all want to speak to that. How did you feel about your daughter deciding to run uh, collegially, Kelsey, who was another one that was confused with me because I think we're only a year apart uh, and at Tennessee at the same time. Talk about the difference between your two experiences as women in sport and, and coming up through that. And now it's Kelsey Kane Holtzman. So then I'm people, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Don't uh, tell her husband. He'll beat me up. 
she went to West High School, and actually her husband, Hot Sauce Holtzman, went to Central High School, where Cozy went. Um, but I think it was, it, you know, it was a lot different in that the caliber of athletes was so much greater. Um, JJ was her coach and did a great job. I think her freshman year they won indoor nationals. Um, but she, looking back, she said just the opportunity. Um, I mean, she won some meets. Uh, she ran 447, I think. 446 was her best mile, but she had a big improvement. She was hurt quite a bit, but looking back, it's still her best friends. Um, she got two degrees from it, has a master's, um, accomplished. I know that they still have the record, four by 800 record at the Florida Relays that she had a, a great time. And I think it's just even the, the kids now, knowing that you did your best, uh, making these connections that are lifelong, when she got married two and a half years ago, we had 15, 20 Lady Vols there, and JJ came in from Jersey at the time. So I think all these guys can attest to that, that it's lifelong relationships and encourage, and just seeing how well her co-teammates co have done in to her doctors now, I think athletics, uh, no matter what you accomplish in that, it can set the, the, the plane for doing better in whatever you end up doing. All right, that's very good. Well, um, Mr. Cozy, uh, kind of speaking of the same thing, what's it like coaching your daughter, um, who then goes on to success and having a collegiate career at NC State? Impossible. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, she's <laughs> he's laughing. No, it's it's been uh, it's been a blessing. Um, you know, it's 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 um, created a different relationship in some ways but in some ways it's actually um uh it, it's um enhanced the relationship we already had um to be able to uh sit back now and watch her move on and kind of pass that baton to another coach uh has been something that's been interesting for sure um i almost think that i started coaching in high school uh what uh, eight years ago i guess nine years ago now uh, almost to prepare me for the day that she was to go and leave because um, I take such an interest in all the athletes that I do coach. Um, and, and even to go back to kind of training right now, I've even got a lot of those kids that are Division One athletes now that are now back here in Knoxville and, and we're training and we're kind of gone back to the basics. And it is, it doesn't have to be complicated like um, B and Missy. Um, like they've said, you know, it's, it's, you know, we're back to just doing some basics and making sure we're fit, and we'll 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 look at the opportunities when they when they come up. And I'm in contact with their coaches, but um, but yeah, Taylor, interesting enough, is back in Knoxville as most of the most kids are from college, and so I'm back to coaching Division One athletes. Actually, interestingly enough, but uh, that's been an interesting mix um, as they've come back to Knoxville and making sure we're keeping our social distance and making sure we're finding the right places to train and, and still get in what we need to get in. Um, and, uh, but it's been, it's been uh, a call, you know, to see Taylor go on to NC state. Um, you know, the most exciting thing for me is to see how much she loves it, how much she's made it her own. And uh, that's, that's true of any kid, no matter what they do, whether it's running or any career they choose. And that's been what's been exciting for me. Uh -huh. Uh, Tavis, how did you get started in throwing and particularly what attracted you to the disc? Um, <clears throat> so I kind of started off in track, kind of middle school, um, like a lot of people kind of pick up track then. And at the time, it was just something different. Um, I played football and kind of coming from the community that I came from, football and basketball were the two big things that everyone did. And so what I kind of did was I gravitated to track just because, hey, here's another opportunity for me to do something that my brothers weren't doing and just kind of have my own identity, kind of like Tony was saying, to kind of make this my own. Um, and then it was just kind of shot putter discus and the shot puts were all muddy because it was March. <laughs> uh, so I kind of just picked up the discus and could get it to fly better than everyone else. And there it was. It was kind of love at, at first sight. And um, they just kind of stuck from there on out. All right. Um, Tony uh, Perilla, how did you handle letting your kids decide on sports? Um, and what, what did you feel when they eventually did choose track all three of them? Well, um, you know, my job as a parent is just to give them all the tools and to be there to support them. 
Um, you know, we, I think starting kids off in soccer is good because, you know, they get to run around, they get to work as a team, they get to just learn a lot of the things that are going to get them to that next level. So after that, those 12, 13, 14 year old years where you go from, go from doing a few sports to kind of specializing. I mean, it's a lot earlier now than it was back in the day, but you know, once we ended up getting to that point, um, you know, I just, uh, I said, whatever you do, I'm just going to be your biggest cheerleader. I mean, Tony was a little bit of a different route. Um, my oldest son was, he, he found it very difficult to play team sports because he, in his mind, he couldn't wrap his brain around 10 other people not being able to, to basically kill themselves on the soccer pitch. And, um, you know, it was very hard for him to process that. So after uh, his last really bad red card, I just said, you know, it's time for you to you know, just do more of an individual sport where you could, you know, get out what you put into it, you know, and I said wrestling, you know, tennis, you know, swimming, uh, track, you know, there was a bunch of options and um, he really enjoyed track. Uh, He, you know, he grew up, uh, uh, you know, slapping Charlie Simpkins in the face, grew up with Eric Long and uh, his twins, Um, you know, just grew up in the track community uh, here and you know and I was giving back some it gave me an opportunity to you know get into more of the coaching side and I didn't necessarily coach their events you know and then um, you know Miguel was my late bloomer he didn't really get serious about it until uh, his junior year but you know he tried some things out didn't didn't put a lot of effort into um, into one sport And then, you know, my daughter really enjoys dancing and cheerleading and, you know, she runs track at Hardin Valley. So, you know, there's a lot of really good thing that things that track have done. Luckily, they've kind of gravitated towards that. And it's and it's really difficult to just be a father and not a coach. But, you know, Brian Brown does did an amazing job. And I've been blessed enough to uh, that my oldest son went to UT and enjoyed himself there. And um, my youngest son is running for um, my old coach. So that definitely helps, you know, because there's that huge trust factor being able to, you know, to let, you know, to let the duckling go. So, and my daughter's still with the best high school coach, you know, around here and it's in Brian Brown. And uh, coached a few of us in this panel. Um, yeah, uh, Miguel's coach rather. Um, so moving on to Kelsey, um, talk about you know, how you have managed to train during all this and how, how have you explored other resources and things like that to try to um, make sure you're not losing a step as we wait to see if you'll have any, tra- any meets this summer. Yeah, so right now I can't do any pole vaulting. Um, as you can imagine, you need a bit of equipment to be able to do that. So I have a set of dumbbells an exercise ball, some bands, and... You watch Missy Kane Fit and Fun in the morning? (laughs) I've been on Missy Kane Fit and Fun. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think that's great. Um, I'm working with very limited equipment, and I'm still getting great workouts in. I did order a stationary exercise bike that came yesterday, and I'm very excited about it. So I'm kind of just doing some hill workouts, um, some bike workouts, and then some different body weight circuits and also some circuits with the dumbbells. And that's what I'm sticking to this month. And I've just kind of refocused my mind on what I can do instead of thinking about what I can't do. And I'm just going to get really fit this month. And at least I can come out on the other side of it, knowing I'm in really good shape and that will give me confidence going into the rest of the summer if we do get to pole vault. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, so, Charlie, what attracted you to the triple jump, and did you compete in other events while you were growing up? I did, um, but what attracted me to the triple jump, uh, my junior year, I was playing basketball. And I played basketball in high school, and um, I remember going up for a dunk and missing the dunk, and my face hit the backboard. I got a little color on my eye, and um, my coach pulled me to the side. He said, you should run track and do the high jump. I'm like, really? He said, yes. So when I ran track and uh, one of my friends came up to me and said, man, you want to try the triple jump? I said, what is the triple jump? He showed me how to do the triple jump. I broke the school record that day. 
and it was like it was like heaven sent was something that was meant to be and um and I started winning track till I was a junior in high school. Um, I high jumped seven two, I long jumped twenty five feet, uh, ran twenty points so in the two hundred meters, ran on the four by four, about passed out. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when you run track, my coach told me one time, um, he wanted me to do the four by four. And I said, coach, um, my scholarship, scholarship, I come here on a jump scholarship. He said, your scholarship said track and field. And that's what you're going to do. So that's how I got it. Yeah, Perilla, Perilla, uh, of course, him and his kids had the beauty of being 400, 800 kids. So they had the cursor on the four by eight first and the four by four last, right? Yeah, um, it's not for me. <laughs> That's great. Um, anyone else in here uh, come from another sport before track? Eric? Here. Yeah, I played football. Yeah. Before. Football. I was a four sport athlete all through high school. So I know Tony was mentioning the specialization, but I do think that's something important for parents to hear. Like, I really am anti specialization too early. I think it's good to be exposed to a lot of different sports and I played team sports and individual sports, and I think that's benefited me well in, in sport and life. I did everything but run. In fact, that I was, I was, I was a, uh, I, I bought into the old coach's mentality, old school, that running's punishment and uh, didn't like it at all. And, but hey, a little bit of success goes a long ways, and that's what we need. That, that's what we need. You know, um, and at the end of the day, if we provide a little bit of success for kids, you know, you never know where they're going to end up. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Success breeds confidence, and confidence breeds success, right? That's right. Um, Eric Long has a great story about being recruited as a football player. Just do, just do it. Just do the small one, Eric. Uh, so everyone told me I, I was 6'2", two, two, my same height around 250. Uh, blue chip, uh, most Division I uh, universities told me I needed to be faster. I said, well, how do you want me to get faster? They said, well, go run track. We don't care what you do. Just go run track. And this was my junior year. And he said, do hurdles. It'll make you more flexible. Uh, throw the shot put if you want. You know, and I, I could dunk the ball. I could hit my head on the rim and all those other things. So I, I did hurdles, shot put, disc, and high jump. Seven foot high jump you know, I ran some pretty decent times. And uh, Ed Nuttycomb from the University of Wisconsin comes in. Uh, they were looking at a dual scholarship. He said, well, you're a pretty good high jumper. You're a pretty good football player. We were looking at you both directions. And I said, you know, can you give a dual scholarship? And they, the Big Ten was doing that. You'd get 50% from football, 50% from track. And uh, the more and more we talked, uh, next thing you know, I broke down in tears crying. And he's like, tell me what's wrong. What did I say? I said, I don't want to run. Uh, I don't want to play football anymore. He goes, well, you're, you're really good at football. But I said, I think I could be really good at track. And he said, well, as big as you are, you're, we don't have decathlon in the Big Ten, but I know a guy. And within a week of that time, he had called Doug Brown and I flew into the University of Tennessee and really didn't know what the hell decathlon was. I knew Bruce Jenner was on the box, and he <laughs> seemed pretty cool. Uh, wow. But uh, I, I made a decision sitting in my hallway in my childhood at home with Ed Nettico. And I call him probably once a year to tell him thank you uh, for being there and listening. He's a great resource. He's still at the University of Wisconsin. I'm not sure what capacity he's at. But, uh, yeah, every, I'm a, not a proponent of uh, single sport kids uh, at a young age, yeah, once they get that junior, senior year. Uh, as competitive as it is, but get out there and do all those things that you thought were not fun. Go try them. Uh, learn how to juggle. That was one of the funnest things I ever did. Uh, I was injured, and uh, I was talking to one of the former uh, Olympic champion decathletes. He said, you know what? You're driving me nuts. Learn how to juggle. And he said, do not come back to the track until you learn how to juggle. So we didn't have the internet back then, so I go to the library and get a book, and, um, you know, you throw one up, throw one up. So I went back the next day, and he said, I, I can juggle three balls. And he said, now you can do it at Catalan. And it didn't make a lot of sense to me at that point. He said, you're always going to have two or three things that you can't get done in that day, but you really need to pick up those three balls that will make you more successful. So learn how to wow. juggle. And I've, I've had many speeches where I've tried to incorporate that in because uh, – Tony Cozy's a business professional. I mean, we've all got jobs and careers, but what are we picking up and what are we putting down? Uh, and as you young athletes in there uh, that are stuck behind, you know, four walls or maybe in your backyard, 
there's a ball that you can pick up. There's something that you can do to make, make yourself better, improve yourself, whether it's just reading a book or reading about something that you've never wanted to learn before. So your, your heart and your mind uh, get you a lot of places. So. Well, you kind of an answered my next question, which was how did, you, how did you discover the decathlon? So I think Brent may have a general question for us. Yeah, here's a toss-up. Anybody that wants it and multiple people can answer. Um, many people will be excited to meet an Olympian, and I know some people in town don't even realize how many are around. Uh, but who did you look up to when you were growing up? Who was kind of somebody, you know, if you even if you started another sport, just kind of that um, athletic idol, and then when you did start to come into track, maybe a track person, who were you looking up to? One of my idols was um, a hurler named Elwin Moses. His um, aunt and uncle stayed right next to me. <laughs> and we used to talk about him. I idolized him. I said, man, I would like to be like that one day. So he was one of my idols. Um, for me, mine was... Go ahead, Tony. Okay, now, mine was from... Um, uh, we didn't get, obviously didn't have the same things in Panama as we did in the U.S. So I saw this movie of Victory and watching Pele play, you know, that was, I think, Sylvester Stallone's first movie and watching, you know, watching Pele play soccer and being around soccer and boxing growing up. You just see a lot of people that, uh, you know, just working out and just doing uh, those sports, you know, you know, Roberto Duran and all that. But really, but really like Pele was, but my first uh, track, I guess, uh, you know, person that I looked up to was uh, Saida Wida. That guy had the biggest range from 10K to 800. And uh, whether he took those Flintstone vitamins or not, I, I don't care, man. He has an unbelievable range and I love to watch him run. For, for me, for me, a little, uh, go ahead, Davis, go ahead. Go ahead <laughs> I was going to say for me, I had a teammate in college named Matthew Hody. Um, I was a football player my entire life until I stepped foot on the University of Tennessee's campus. Um, he just kind of provided like a, a good role model figure, like, hey, let's not go out and drink. Hey, um, let's watch film. Hey, let's go to the training room. Um, so sometimes you're the person you look up to doesn't necessarily have to be a uh, four-time gold medalist. For me, it was just a, say we we're the same age. He just kind of guided me and kind of helped point me in the right direction when I was first getting in the track yeah that's that's where i was going to tavis for me it was uh a, a guy by the name of brad higdon uh brad higdon was uh, at the time i lived across the street from me and and uh i was in middle school he was in high school he ended up being a state champion he went he actually was steeplechaser at tennessee i think he finally made a travel team his senior year and scored at secs in the steeplechase um, but for, for me, Brad, he, uh, I was in middle school. Uh, it was, we had moved to Fountain City, um, needless to say, out of some circumstances here in Knoxville. I'm not going to get into a whole life story, but bottom line, uh, I was still pretty much a punk, if you will, and uh, uh, knew at Gresham and run the physical fitness test, you know, a mile. And uh, Brad had that middle school record at, at uh, Gresham. Needless to say, I was a second off of it in the pre-test, and I was going to get it in the post-test. And I just wanted to make sure he knew it because he was my neighbor. Since he was uh, touted to be the next state champion and being recruited by Tennessee, I'll never forget going knock on his door, being the punk I was, just to make sure he knew. And uh, he just smiled, and he just said that was just the greatest thing ever. And I couldn't believe his humility. And uh, he wasn't offended at all. And he, uh, in fact, the next year said, hey, why don't you come on out for, uh, you know, Central Bobcats cross country. And I thought that was just huge because, you know, after all, I was being asked on a varsity sport. Little did I know I show up and I couldn't find them because there's only three of them and they were sporadic around the stadium. <laughs> I think they were under it at the time. But needless to say, that was, uh, that was somebody that I looked up to. He kind of took me under his wing and Help me understand what hard work and what that produces, and and uh, and and but more than anything else, the humility of no matter how far you get, uh, never forget where you come from. Thanks. Uh, that's a great great answer. Um, anyone else before I move on? Okay. Uh, last round of questions, um, and then we'll let y'all move on with the the rest of your evening. I know your schedules are all really tight right now. 
Um, so you went into the Olympics, uh, this is for Missy. Um, you went to the Olympics as the fourth place finisher at the Olympic trials in the 1500. Talk about what happened that led you to being able to be on that starting line and how did you prepare your mind between the trials and the games, leaving the trials not knowing for sure if you were going to get to compete in LA? Um, I tell kids now, don't, um, you know, always have your focus just to do the best you can. And so at the Olympic trials in the 1500, um, I barely made through the semi, it was three rounds, prelim semis and finals. And I, I qualified, I think 11th out of 12 for the finals. So I was a nervous wreck and, um, I remember running the race and I just kept thinking, I just want to do my best. And I tried to put it away from me that if I don't do well, cause of my shoe company or whatever, just do the best I can. And Mary Decker was world champion at the time and they went out really fast. And, and I remember going through the 800 and 211. I think that was a second best, better than I ever ran in college. And I was like, Whoa. And, and I kept going and with about a lap to go, I was in seventh, eighth place. And, um, Kim Gallagher or somebody kind of tripped and I had to go way around and all of a sudden uh, I just started digging in and I knew it didn't look like I was going to make the team top three, but I thought, you know, it was the day before I went to this athletes in action like FCA and, and Carl Lewis was there. It was only about five of us, but the verse was second Timothy four, seven and eight. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. I even had that like written in my, my warm up bag. And I, I, I thought of that just the last turn and I thought I'm dying and I'm really hurting but I've just got to dig in and do the best I can, no matter what place I get. So I, I dug in and I almost collapsed at the line. I came in fourth, which was one place out of the team, but I ran 406, which is like 425 for the mile. And I remember I just felt so at peace and relief thinking I didn't give up on myself. And that was my far, far better than I'd ever run in my life. And um, so I congratulated Mary, but she didn't, I didn't realize she didn't even win. Ruth Wasaki won that race. And, um, so I got to take pictures with him, but I, I really wasn't disappointed. I was going back and finishing my master's and I had a job that I was doing part-time. And then I got a call at the married student apartment saying, is this Missy Kane? I said, yes. They went, well, congratulations. You made the Olympic team. Mary's decided just to run the 3000 meters. And as you all know, as Olympians, that doesn't happen very often at all. Um, I'd made the standard. Um, so it was just a huge blessing. And, um, and then I had to kind of, you know, get in shape again and get out there. But, um, you know, it, to me, it was just this God thing that, you know, uh, it was just meant to be. And, but I tell kids just, you never know when you're in a race or doing something that if you give it your all, you never know what's going to happen. It may not look to everybody else that you're quote a winner or that you uh, accomplished great things. But if you don't give up on, if you don't give up on yourself, that is, something that's just instilled in you to always do your best. Not that I always do, but um, for me, that was just an eye-opening experience and just um, a real blessing to be on the team and experience it all. That's great advice. Um, you know, especially for these kids, like, you know, they're not sure if they have a state championship as a high schooler, you know, how, you know, you may have to refocus quickly um, if, they, if they are able to compete um, in a few weeks. So um, great advice. So, Cozy, um, talk about how your World Cross Country dip experience, you're the only one here that um, did World Cross. So how was that experience kind of different than um, your Olympic experience? And did you like certain things about the World uh, Cross Country experience um, over the Olympic experience? Um, I think probably the, the thing that, was, uh, that probably impressed me the most about World Cross, um, and, and this is true of – any one of those teams that I made, it was always the same. And that's what always drew me back to, you know, to, to cross was that it was as close to being a really close knit team. Um, you know, I talk about it being a selfish sport and it is an individual sport and especially with track, but cross country is the closest thing as a distance runner that you have to a team sport. And it really is. And, and uh, no matter where you're training, if it's halfway across the country or across the country and, and you know, we go and make the team um, for cross country to go represent the country truly as a team, um, that's probably, uh, uh, you know, when you're out there running and, you know, your, your, score, your score counts. And, uh, you know, to help the team or, um, or um, you know, to really do your best um, for others as well as yourself. That's probably the most fun um, for me as a distance runner. Uh, it was always in a unique place, always with unique challenges. Um, one of the things I tell kids that I coach and cross now is, 
you know, it, Europe has a totally different view of cross country than we do. And uh, the harder they can make it, the more difficult the conditions, always the better cross country course it is. I've, I've not been, and I've been to all three different world cross teams that I made. Every one we show up the day before and they got fire trucks out there watering it down. One time it's pouring down the rain and they're still watering it down. <laughs> You know, throw hay bales out there, whatever they can. It's it's a disaster, and it's just uh, you know, watch and see what we can do, kind of thing. So always interesting, but um, but a lot of fun because you know you're towing the line, uh, not just for your country, but for your teammates as well. Yeah, I mean we we like to try to make the courses as hard as we can as well. So um, <laughs> try to bring that European feel to it. <laughs> um, Tavis, you kind of answered a question that I had for you, so I'll just ask it slightly different. How did you balance doing two sports at the same time? With football, um, and, with football yeah. and, and track at Lenore Ryan and probably before that. It's tough. It's like um, like a lot of kind of other people uh, alluded to. You There's a lot of juggling involved. Um, there's a lot of repurposing involved. You stay really busy. Um, in high school, it's you're busy year round in the weight room year round. Uh, to me, that was just normal. It was normal to grind. It was normal to always be carrying uh, shoes, shorts, and a t-shirt in my backpack. Um, I always had football practice or track practice. So um, to me, it was something I really enjoyed. So when I got to college and in the fall, I was slammed with football and still trying to make track meetings and vice versa in the spring. Um, it's just something that you get used to. You get used to juggling things. You get used to having this increased um, workload on you so that when life does actually throw you lemons or well beyond your sport, um, for me to to get off work at five o'clock and then go work in the yard for four hours or go to the gym and do something or uh, I just kind of developed a capacity for juggling things. So it's one of those things that I kind of tell everyone like, do do the sports, it, the volume makes you better. The juggling makes you better. Builds your character. It does so many things for you. Um, that's good. I, did they did they give you a release on the twenty hour practice limit? <laughs> <in college? laughs> no, I don't. You know, in high school, like you think about those rules, and you're just like, you know what? No, I remember waking up at six to go to class, and then going to weights after school and then going to like, no, it was 6 a.m. to like 8, 9 p.m. for most of my life. So. Uh, yeah, we tried to remind our coaches that there's a 20-hour limit coach. We're right at 22 right now. Um, but that never happened, right? Um, <laughs> Kelsey, I'm sorry, Tony uh, Perilla. Um, a lot of people that have watched your races um, are I, – I, this is an easy question for you because we talk about this all the time. But a lot of people watch your races um, feel that you have an excellent kick you want to speak to uh do you actually have a kick or no it technically no it is the rate of deceleration um just i disagree you have a kick i like to <laughs> it's um i had a lower rate of deceleration because of how we train um you know coach watts and i just uh Hurting was fun. Doing negative splits was fun. So doing it the hard way was always fun. Um, if you do watch the races, I, I run out in lane two, lane three. That's what always is funny to me when all these people are talking about, oh, you, you ran in lane two, you ran two meters. Well, who cares? Just as long as you have an open way and you can go ahead and run, you know, just it, it doesn't matter. Lane one, lane two, it really doesn't matter. So, um, the way, the way how we trained was to run everything as even as possible. And what I always tell my people that I've ever trained is the interval recovery is just as important as the interval. And then sometimes it's more important than the interval itself. So we would end up doing some things, uh, you know, uh, Coach Watts and I would do some pretty crazy things. The fun thing is now I'm watching it, what he's doing uh, with Miguel. So it's pretty fun to watch. And the more even you run, I think the I think the more of a kick it looks like at the end. So, but there were some times that I did some negative splits for fun, and um, yeah, it was a kick. So I yeah, think, I think Miguel tries to model his racing style after you a lot more than Tony did. Well, I just I mean I told both of them, both of them I said find where you feel comfortable, find your racing pattern and just train for that racing pattern. It's 800 meters, so it doesn't matter 
you know, if you get to 600 first, it, 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 I mean, it doesn't. Find your racing pattern and you and train to perfect your racing pattern so that you can cover 800 meters uh, better than anybody else. And, you know, just going back to what Kelsey was saying about keeping it simple, I kept it really simple, you know, the whole, you know, the whole time. I did a lot of plyometrics, a lot of med balls. Uh, not as much stretching as I needed to and that. And, and I did all those things to build up an explosive, um, you know, once I switched to that gear, I was explosive at it because of everything that I did. I trained to be explosive and I did keep it simple. So, you know, yes, I had a kick. But. Yeah. Yeah, you did. Um, Kelsey, I'm looking forward to your response to this question. I read a story about your response to parents telling them to let their children have fun. Talk about what your message is to an athlete and a coach of how parents can strike a good balance between being involved and letting the coach coach. Yeah, I think um, I wrote that kind of in response to my experience coaching. I was coaching gymnastics, Ninja Warrior, and some pole vault. And I realized that a lot of my athletes were really stressed out because of pressure that they felt from their parent. And I had parents coming in with their sophomores in high school who were already talking about college scholarships and we need to get private lessons in. And I was just like, this is supposed to be fun. Like this is the best time where you get to be with your friends and you know, it should be fun. So I think, I think we can all speak to the fact that we all were involved in multiple things and what kept us in the sport was that we loved it and we were having fun doing it. And so I think, that's what's important is that you have your kids involved in things so that they can be social and they can learn how to be coachable and so they can learn how to work with the team and so that they can have an outlet away from school and away from the pressures of the world somewhere that they can really enjoy themselves and push themselves and try to get the most out of themselves. Awesome. Well, um, I read that story. I was like, I really want to ask her a question about that. <laughs> so, um, Charlie, you jump nearly 60 feet. It's an almost 65 by the end of this. Um, and <laughs> you jumped it in, in, in three bounds. So you ran and then jumped three bounds. Um, that can be t intimidating for a lot of people. What would you tell someone nervous about trying it out or trying a difficult niche uh, specialty event like triple jump? Um, I would go back to like what um, Tom Perella said. Um, do the basics. Do a lot of plyometrics and a lot of medicine ball. Because what it does is it strengthen your body to be able to handle that. Because it can be very intimidating. Um, when my first phase is 21 feet, 8 inches, people think like, oh, man, you're just going to snap your leg off. And, but doing the foundation and the fundamentals is what really got me there. Awesome. Uh, um, Eric, um, you can kind of speak to this. I know a lot of people now have moved on into um, careers outside of track and field. Um, balancing all the events in the decathlon, 10 events, a lot of training, different juggle, juggling balls, like you talked about. How has that helped you in your career now? Um, I'm in the restaurant industry, uh, and I've, <laughs> I've had up to 32 stores that, you know, under, under my responsibility. So, uh, obviously, picking the stores and events, kind of the same thing, stores that are doing really well. I was a decent high jumper. B. Miller made me a pretty decent pole vaulter. You didn't have to touch on those that often, uh, so you went to the areas of opportunity. So I wasn't a great sprinter. Um, I was a horrible 1500 meter runner. So uh, sliding to the the events that I was weak in, or going to the locations and stores that needed opportunity and some hurdles removed or some obstacles removed for them, so they could be successful. Uh, so and and playing to win every day. Uh, if you a surround myself with a team that wants to play to win uh, being competitive and you can be competitive on a, any athletic arena or any inside of any four walls it's what your your goals and your tasks that we set forth for anybody to do is uh, be the best at it I heard so many people say today uh, Tony saying be the best at your race because that's it, it, the 800 meters when you finish it you did exactly what you plan to do I finished in 1996 when I retired I couldn't have done any better there were people that are just had advanced faster than farther than me. So I went to every, I went to the hundred meter start line and I put my shoes down. I went to the long jump. I put my shoes down, shot all 10 events. I laid, I laid it down so I could walk away from it, but I took a lot of valuable lessons from learning to juggle events as well as people. Um, when we had sponsors, you had to learn how to sell and market yourself. 
Uh, you couldn't always be the life of the party. You had to put on a different hat. So there's lots of things with uh, that we had to do in athletics as we had our careers accomplished and we got further into our careers. Uh, you had to pick up a different hat and wear it. Had to pick up a different ball. It was just same ten balls, just different uh, atmosphere. Just got one more, and then I'll I'll wrap up. I appreciate all y'all your questions so far today. Brent. Okay. Yeah, I wish we had uh, more time, but uh, I'll I'll finish up with this one, and it's a little bit of a two parter. It's uh, what's one thing you wish you knew back then that would have made the difference in your career to make it even more successful than it was? And also, since it's kind of an advice type question and we're a youth program. Uh, this kind of goes towards what Kelsey just answered. What can parents do to help their athletes, uh, their, their children athlete in the development? And uh, how can they be a positive part of their child's athletic life? Um, I'll oh, yeah. go ahead and answer what they can do now. Um, I mean, what I know more now than I did before is um, I really wish that I took my uh, uh, diet more serious. Um, you know, I, I guess a double waffle with cheese, no tomato, no onion, extra pickle, add bacon is probably not a good recovery meal. Um, but, uh, it really, really hit me when I saw when my son Miguel, who could eat his body weight in Twizzlers, uh, ended up deciding he wanted to take track serious and he, um, and he, uh, really stuck to a much better diet. I mean, that really made my wheels turn. And, you know, and having Eddie Raymond here uh, over at Eddie's Health Shop, unbelievable resource. So diet, I mean, that's probably the one thing that I would change, you know. And as far as parents, I mean, you know, you know parents have to establish boundaries as parents, but also kids have to, um, you know, understand what the boundaries are and let their parents know that, you know, sometimes what they say is, um, is not positive. You know, I mean, I mean, I always try to be very positive out there. I always try to crack jokes with the kids when they line up and, you know, I just want them to understand just like Kelsey said, I mean, I mean, this is, uh, this is the most fun that you're going to have. And because after, after you go to college, it's, <laughs> it's business, you know, so, um, you know, diet and then, you know, just let the parents understand it. It's okay to relax. I've got one. I, I truly have one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm on. Okay. No. Yeah. You're on. Oh, okay. Is, is, is listening to your body, uh, talking to your kids about rest. Uh, I wish I would have there. The training has got so much more advanced. These kids are training more specific and targeted uh, more, more, a lot more targeted towards their, their, their goal than going out and hammering it every day, six and seven days a week. Not, it's not, it was, it's what we did back then. But if I could have listened to my body a little bit more, uh, and taking those rest days versus going and try to run another four or five mile or throwing a shot foot 15 more times, injuries occurred, uh, you trained bad habits. So if, as a, on the parent side, is recognizing when your kid is a little bit overworked and making sure that they are spending that time in a bed or taking them to, you know, physical therapy or taking them to the training room. Just get some rest. It isn't, uh, especially at this age, it ain't the end of the world, I can assure you. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I know something I've um, kind of struggled with a little bit in my career uh, recently, and I think it applies to kids today, is um, having some boundaries around social media, because as you try to work toward your own goals, you can get really sidetracked by what other people are doing, and that's something that I've had to do for myself, is just to set some boundaries so that I'm not constantly looking at what my competitors are doing, because it really takes the focus off of doing what I need to do day in and day out and staying in my own lane and just finding confidence in what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm going to jump on that. And the, the two, I'm going to piggyback on both what Eric and Kelsey said. I mean, at the end of the day, rest is huge. I always thought I was doing something wrong running, you know, a long run at nine minutes, you know, uh, all I had was George telling me, Hey, the Kenyans, it's about accumulated volume and just get it done. You know, um, at the end of the day, more is not better. It's just not. Um, if 
you know, and that's, that goes to, to what we were talking about, about doing multiple sports and other things. Sometimes if you just want to be active, be active, but, you know, specializing and more isn't always better. You got to rest, you got to let your body recover, but then going uh, to, you know, what I would recommend to parents um, oftentimes, you know, I, as a parent myself of three kids, I can tell you, I want my kids to be better than me. I want them to have more than me. I want them to, you know, I want them to have the best. I want them to do all. And so as I coach athletes, I, I try to even help them understand the parents' perspective that it's coming from a place of love. The parents, please back off. It's not helping. And at the end of the day, I'm pretty cut and dry. If you want to be the coach, I'll be the parent, you know, and I'm going to love on your kid and we're going to have the greatest time, but it's going to cause all kinds of problems for you at home. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to coach your kid instead of being their parent. And all they need to hear from you is that you love them. And there's no way you could do what they're doing nine times out of 10. So just love them and tell them, wow, I'm impressed. This is fantastic. But going to what Kelsey said, oftentimes that comes from a place of the parents looking at what other kids are doing, what this person's doing, what that, and the stages of development are different and unique with every different person. And, you know, it's, we talk about it, you know, there's people right here on the screen that maybe was, I mean, I was never an NCAA champion. I was, an, I was never an SEC champion. You know, interestingly enough, I made it a lot further than a lot of those people that were NCAA champions or SEC champions even. You know, the reality is what I instill in my kids that I coach and what I would tell any kid that's watching is focus on you. I tell them, like, it's about your own PRs. It's about your own development, even keeping it basic. If you're, you know, lifting or throwing or whatever, focus on you, continue to improve. And as you improve, the interesting thing is the air gets thinner for lots of reasons. Even kids that I've seen go on to college and they were focused on kids in high school that now aren't even competing for no other reason than they got distracted or they decided they didn't like it or whatever. There's so much to, so much in the whole life lesson of whatever it is you're focusing on. But if you're focused on anything other than your self improvement, whether that's juggling or whether that's your sport, whatever, it's about becoming a better you. And if you do that, the higher you get, the air gets thinner and there's less people around. So whether that's staying in the sport and being consistent or whether that's moving into another career or whatever it is, that's the lesson that I try to instill and in that I would say, hey, just be better. Yeah, and like Frank could probably say the same thing. I mean, you know, I remember being a kid 10 years old and finishing last place in those Saturday meets at UT. And, um, you know, but at the end of the day, I was running at UT in SEC championships, not at y'all's level, but certainly still competing in college. And there's a bunch of people that were probably beating me at 10 years old that never got to run, never ran even high school. So, you know, but anyone else have anything to add before we wrap up? I agree with everyone. Um, I think a lot of time the parents live their dream through their kids, and they can't do that. <laughs> We're not trying to bash parents all night, but but just <laughs> sometimes you have to. And my daughter, she um, her mother um, made the Olympic volleyball team. Um, she made the tryouts, and everybody wanted me to push my daughter to do sports, and she didn't want to. So my daughter went to culinary school. She wanted to be a chef. So she's all American and something else. So um, I'm not living. I didn't want to live my dream through my daughter. I just didn't. I think a lot of parents do that. Anyone else before we wrap up? And now Charlie, Charlie, and now Charlie's eating really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Charlie wins dinner. <laughs> hey, whenever y'all want to come over. <laughs> all right. Well, I guess we'll wrap up. I want to thank everyone that's been tuning in. Um, been a lot of people watching this live stream. And um, there's been a few people that say uh, it, it looked like a Brady Bunch deal, uh, this whole setup. Um, and a bunch of people thanking y'all for taking the time out to, to talk to everyone. Um, yeah, we all look down at each other. And, um, <laughs> but I do want to thank all y'all for taking your time. We'll have to do this again, I guess, some point, maybe after all this uh, stuff passes over. Uh, a lot of people don't realize we had this many um, just in track and field, much less other sports um, in Knoxville that they can uh, reach out to. And great thing about Olympians in track and field is they're usually very accessible. 
and willing to offer advice when needed. So I um, encourage people to reach out to, to y'all and, um, and hopefully, you know, in the next couple of months, um, you know, we're starting to get into some um, one-on-one coaching, trying to uh, doing some virtual classes through Zoom and some other things um, to encourage people keep ex- uh, active during this time and um, that we'll be ready uh, whenever we can be um, for, you know, whether that's uh, the rest of the scholastic season or um, the summer. So just keep tuning in Oxford Youth Athletics. Um, again, we'll have to do this some, some time or get some different people um, as well that weren't able to be on. Um, I want to thank all of y'all for your time. Uh, went a little over what I expected, but we also got a few more people last minute than I expected to. So it was uh, an hour and a half that flew by. So we'll record this, um, allow everyone to go online and watch it um, on our Facebook or YouTube um, once this is all wrapped up. Um, and uh, wish you all the rest of uh, a safe weekend. Stay at home um, and enjoy uh your family, I guess. That's that's the best thing you can do right now. Train and and spend time with your family. So thank you all. Uh, Have a great rest of your night. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.